Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I am starting a new biography series, this one featuring Confederate General Ambrose Powell Hill, more commonly referred to as A.P. Hill. Although discussed to some degree in Civil War circles, I feel he is left out of many discussions outside of the Battle of Antietam, Gettysburg, and Petersburg, so I will be highlighting the life of this interesting commander. On Decoration Day, May 30th, 1892, the city of Richmond, Virginia was inundated with Confederate veterans of the Civil War, as well as civilians from Virginia and other states. Two years earlier, the city had unveiled a statue to Confederate General Robert E. Lee. This year, they were dedicating a statue to another Virginian and Confederate General Ambrose Powell Hill. A three-mile parade filled with veterans of many Southern regiments marched with shouldered muskets to the veiled statue. A little girl named Virginia Memes, the granddaughter of General Hill's chief of staff, pulled the red cord which unveiled the statue to the crowd. One of Hill's biographers stated, In 90 days he rose from Colonel of the 13th Virginia Infantry Regiment to the rank of Major General in command of the Light Division, one of the largest and most distinguished in Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Following the death of his celebrated chief, Stonewall Jackson, he was promoted to Lieutenant General in charge of the newly formed Third Corps. Lee constantly relied on him as a troubleshooter and ranked him next to Jackson and Longstreet among his commanders. Hill's habitat was the battlefield. He possessed what one compatriot termed an unquenchable thirst for battle, and nothing exhilarated him like the fierce joy of victorious fight. Hill's battle attire included a picturesque red shirt, black felt slouch hat, and a drawn sword. Once the battle was joined, he was bold, skillful, tenacious, and utterly oblivious to his personal safety. Even though fierce in battle, he extended every courtesy and consideration to a captured or fallen foe. In appearance, he stood 5 feet 10 inches and weighed about 160 pounds. His frame was so slight that President Jefferson Davis referred to him as Little A.P. Hill. His handsome face was graced with long curling hair and a luxuriant red beard which, like Stewart's, disguised his youth. High cheekbones, a Roman nose, and intense hazel eyes which blazed when angry and lit up with a steely glint in battle were relieved by a slight but very pleasant smile which seemed to light up his face all the time. His slender arms merged into long, slightly tapering virile hands. Despite his service record, A.P. Hill has been overshadowed by other historical juggernauts of the South like Lee, Jackson, and Longstreet. Hill's ancestors arrived along the Virginia coast in the 1600s and were successful tobacco growers. Russell Hill would move into the Virginia wilderness in 1740 to Culpeper, Virginia, and established a homestead known as Stranger's Rest. Russell's son, Henry, served under Light Horse Harry Lee during the American Revolution and would marry the daughter of adventurer and surveyor Captain Ambrose Powell, of which the Powell Valley that runs from Virginia into Tennessee is named, as well as the river that runs through it. Their son, Thomas Hill, would be a leading politician and merchant in Culpeper County. Thomas married Fanny Russell Baptist, and she would give birth to Ambrose Powell Hill on November 9, 1825, named after the child's great-grandfather. As he got older, he would attend a neighborhood school, then progress to Bleak Hill Seminary. He bonded with his mother because of their mutual love of books. She and the rest of the family would call him Powell. His reading list consisted of the Bible, Shakespeare, vast amounts of poetry, novels, and histories of Napoleon's military exploits. Although they bonded over books, her hypochondria made her children keep their distance as they got older. Hill spent time hunting and fishing with his tall father. They enjoyed riding together, and his riding ability was noticed by his subordinates years later. One wrote, He was a perfect picture in the saddle and the most graceful rider I ever saw. When he was 15, an evangelical preacher named Ireland proselytized the Virginians around Culpeper and brought them into the Baptist New Light movement, including Hill's mother and father. After that, cards, dancing, and the theater were added to the forbidden list in the Hill household. Ambrose sought to get out from under his parents' strict rules by gaining an appointment to West Point. His vast reading of military exploits by Napoleon and his own family military history convinced him that that was the best route for him to go. Through his father's political power, Ambrose, against his mother's objections, obtained an appointment by politician John S. Barber. When he left his Culpeper home for New York, his father gave him a Bible. Inscribed inside was the words, Ambrose Powell Hill, peruse this every day. His mother's gift was unique. 
It was a small ham bone, which was a good luck charm. He would carry it his entire life. Ambrose Powell Hill would arrive at West Point in 1842 to begin his military studies. During the summer encampment, Hill would share a room with George B. McClellan. They quickly became good friends. Some of his other classmates were Burkett D. Fry, Dabney H. Murray, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, George Pickett, and Cadmus Wilcox. Hill and Jackson were never friends at West Point. Hill was of a higher social status in Virginia than Jackson, and both knew it. While Jackson had to study long and hard to survive West Point, education came easier to Hill. Jackson scorned levity. Hill sought a good time. Jackson practiced religion with a fervor that Hill detested. Once they survived the summer encampment and entrance exam, the school year started and the mornings were spent learning algebra, geometry, and trigonometry, while the afternoons would be passed learning French. In early January, the students took their semi-annual examinations that lasted from 8 until 1, then from 2 till 4. One student described it as the long agony, but Hill was able to overcome the examination. He longed for some affection from his parents around this time. After nine months, he had received no letter or any communication from his mother or father. He begged them to write or to visit, but he was not optimistic. After finishing his second year, he was able to go home for the first time after entering West Point. He spent a relaxing two months with family, then proceeded to New York City, spent a short time in the city, then steamed up the Hudson River to the academy. Shortly after arriving, he was admitted into the academy hospital with gonorrhea contracted on furlough. He most likely acquired it while in New York City. The superintendent warned the students not to stay in the city and warned them against harems of pleasure in church and Mercer streets. Treatment at the time consisted of regular doses of a thick, yellowish-brown, spicy-smelling liquid with an ungodly taste used for everything under the sun, but it was a useless treatment. In some people, gonorrhea runs its course and leaves no lasting effects, but in the weeks to follow, Hill experienced more severe symptoms, severe pelvic pain, fever, and difficulty urinating. The urethral strictures produced by the gonococcus had led to painful prostatitis. He went home to recover, which took nearly a year. He would return to the academy in the fall of 1845, but had to repeat that year's studies, putting him in the graduating class of 1847 alongside Ambrose Burnside and fellow Virginian Harry Heath. In February, like all Februaries at West Point, the Army officers at the Academy held a large dinner on George Washington's birthday, and out of courtesy to the cadets, would invite the cadet captain and adjutant to join them for the feast. This year, for some reason, there was no invitation. The entire class was offended. So Heath, William Wallace Burns, and the other cadet officers, including Hill, met in Hill's room. They conspired to ruin the dinner. The cadet officers broke into the mess hall with clothes bags and began to fill it with all the delicacies prepared for the dinner, including oranges, nuts, apples, wine, and cigars. Then they lugged it back to Hill's room. Heath and Burns volunteered to complete the crime. As one of the servers was walking the baked turkey from the kitchen to the officer's mess hall, Burns snuck up behind him and punched him right behind the ear. The man fell forward and the turkey fell right into Heath's arms. They carried it away to Hill's room where the cadet officers dove into the food, wine, and cigars. One remembered later, never were ten boys happier, never did a turkey have, before or since, the flavor of this turkey. In 1847, graduating 15th out of a class of 38, Brevet 2nd Lieutenant Ambrose Powell Hill received his orders to join the light battery of the 1st U.S. Artillery. Hill had been depressed when the class of 1846, the class he should have been in, marched away to the war with Mexico but now he would be joining the campaign as well. He first visited Culpeper, then traveled to New Orleans, where he got on a ship bound for Veracruz. Unfortunately, along the way, his ship collided with another ship, but his would right itself and continued on to Veracruz.